So good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so this is this lecture on Parallel Python. You guys already know me, but for the internet people who maybe don't, I'm Jenny Rinker. And I'm a researcher here at DTU Wind. Um, you can't really see this because for some reason our projector does not allow red. Um, but this is a lecture that I actually gave a couple weeks ago in the 2019 Advanced Scientific Python Programming Summer School. Uh, same topic, this lecture is almost identical, I've only tweaked a few things. Um, and so are we giving it here today at DTU Wind? So the first thing that you guys get to do, you're all fresh, I hope, it's 9 a.m. in the morning, is uh, you get to talk to your partner or groups of three. And I want you to do a bit of brainstorming. And I want you to think about why are you here? Why, uh, how could you possibly benefit from parallelization? So talk amongst your partner or in your group and come up with at least two practical examples of where parallelization could benefit you uh, in terms of your research or just some sort of application that you do. So take a few minutes and just talk to your partner about that, and then we'll come together. So those were actually all really good examples, um, which I like to categorize them into kind of two separate categories. Uh, the first category would be, first off, you want to speed up computations. So either you want to do more computations, or you want to do the same number of computations in a shorter time, or you want to be able to do more computations in the same amount of time, right? So both of those kind of fall within just making things faster. The second category, which we actually, I don't think any of these examples hit upon, is basically if you need to process big things. So data that doesn't fit into memory, for example, or if you want to need to do like CFD calculations where you can't actually hit everything at the same time, then you need to parallelize and you need to have certain bits being processed in different parts, right? So you can load it into memory. So, and then as for how we actually parallelize, well, that's the whole point of this talk, so that will hopefully be answered by the end. Okay, part one, threads, processes, and the gill. Dun, dun, dun. Which I have this tradition, every time I say the gill, I'm gonna do that for the remainder of this, this presentation, so you guys are gonna be very tired of it soon. So first off, before we can actually discuss parallelization and go into you know, how we would parallelize, I think it's actually important that we understand what kind of default Python would do. So this is just standard vanilla flavored Python. You haven't done anything fancy. What is actually going on under the hood? I should also note that Python, when I say Python for the remainder of this talk, I'm basically talking about C Python, which is Python that's been compiled in C. That is the majority of Python distributions that are out there. If you guys are running Anaconda, that's what you have. Um, you should be aware that there are, in fact, other types of Python, and some of the things that we'll discuss actually aren't applicable over there. But for this presentation, pretty much, you can, everything is Python, C Python, it's good. So when we have our computer, and we go ahead and we open a terminal, and we enter this command, well, what's actually going on? What's it actually doing? Well, that's going to depend on your architecture. So. Old school architecture, right? This is like some of the first computers out there. They were actually much simpler than what we have today. First off, you only have one CPU. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. You have a bit of memory down here that kind of stores things temporarily, right? And then they didn't have what's called hyperthreading. So hyperthreading is actually a feature of modern Intel chips. It came around in like 2003-ish, I think. Um, and it's basically a bit of logic that's bundled with the chip so that the operating system will actually see two logical CPUs where there's actually one physical CPU. There's a bit of nuance in that and how it actually works that I'm not gonna go into. It's out, outside of the scope of this presentation. But the short version is basically with hyperthreading, one physical CPU looks like two logical CPUs. But back in the day, we didn't have that. We just had one CPU, we had our memory. So when you go in and you enter Python compute stuff in a terminal on this sort of architecture, the first thing that happens is that this will actually spawn what's called a process. The process, she's the empress of the calculations. She gets to control all this stuff and kind of figure out what goes where and all sorts of things. And then the process, she actually spawns what's called a thread. And the definition of a thread is it's the smallest unit of commands that an operating system can schedule, which I don't find that super intuitive as a definition. So the way that I think about it is it's just a pipeline of computations that needs to be done, right? 
So it's just all of this arithmetic and all of this you know, memory moving and all of that stuff that just needs to be done in your script. And that's what's within the thread, is just the actual computations, more or less. And then the process also has access to some memory down here. So there's some memory that's been reserved for that process. So that all of the variables that you've defined and stuff in the script as it's going through, they live here. So the thread can access them, and then the empress up here controls everything. Now, that was old school architecture. Now, modern day computers are a little bit more complicated. First off, almost all computers will have multiple CPUs. For example, my laptop here actually has two physical CPUs. In addition to that, I'm running off of Intel chips, which are a lot of processors out there, um, which means that I have hyperthreading. So then if I was to draw a rough diagram of this laptop here, it would look like this. So I have two physical CPUs, and then each one looks to the operating system like two logical CPUs thanks to hyperthreading, right? So each physical CPU is hyperthreaded, so the OSC is for logical CPUs. That's what LCPU is standing for. Now, we would very much hope that with this nice fancy architecture, with all of these nice logical CPUs, Python would be super smart, right? When I say Python compute stuff.py, it's going to launch things using all of the logical CPUs that I have available, right? That would be great. Unfortunately, that's not how Python works. Python will still, by default, only launch a single process with a single thread, and then there's some memory associated with that. So for example, if I'm running standard Python on this laptop, pure Python code, I'm only using 25% of my CPUs, which is obviously suboptimal, right? That's why we want to be able to change our Python code so that we can leverage all of the CPUs on our laptop. So before we move on, just a quick review of terminology, because I know, I mean, like, I don't know about you guys, but I usually don't mess around with computer architecture in my day-to-day -day life. So um, CPU or processor uh, is what it's also sometimes called. And that's just the unit on your computer that performs computation, which is a very tautological definition since CPU stands for Central Processing Unit, and I've just defined it as a unit that does, well, anyway. Um, but basically, all you need to think about is this is the, th the, the thing that like, does the arithmetic, right? Does the number crunching. Hyperthreading is a feature of Intel chips, and then the operating system will see one physical CPU as two logical CPUs. Um, so sometimes, actually, if you look up specs for Intel chips, they'll actually list the number of cores and threads. So it's unfortunate that they, they switch terminology. So core would be physical CPU, and then thread would be logical CPU. So you can kind of be aware of that. The factor of two is that's standard, though, so that's easy enough. And then a process is actually an instance of a program. So for example, the Python interpreter. And then it could also be, for example, a Jupyter notebook. Um, and then this is the empress of the computations, the calculations that controls everything. Threads are the pipeline of computations, and they are spawned by the processes. And yeah, chain of executable commands. OK, any questions on these definitions before we move on? Because it's important that you at least have a rough idea of the dif difference between all of this before we move forward. Um, I'm not sure if other chips have it, but as far as I know, it's basically a, a, a thing that Intel sells with their chips. You can have the equivalent feature on AMD chips, but it's not called hyper-threading because that's branding by uh, Intel. Yeah. It's, so, it's, but, but the same feature where you can take one physical CPU and turn it into two virtual CPUs, uh, AMD supports that. So. Okay. So I didn't know that. So now I know. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yes. OK, so if we go back to our modern computer, what can we do to use it more efficiently? Well, there's, there's two main ways, like the most common ways that you've probably heard of, is through either using multiple threads or using multiple processes. And there's differences, there's distinctions between these two things, so we're going to go through each one in detail. 
So we'll start off with multi-threading. So how would our diagram change if we use multiple threads? Let's say two threads. It would look kind of like this. This isn't totally correct because your process wouldn't actually live on two CPUs, but just pretend, okay? Um, and so now we have our same, our same process, who's the empress, but now she has two threads. So we have two pipelines of computations that can be executed. And then the process also has access to the memory down here, just like before. So the nice thing about multi-threading is that the threads can share memory, which is very convenient if, let's say, like thread one is operating on some part of an array and thread two is operating on another part of an array. You no longer need two redundant copies of that array. They can share and access the same memory space. The downside of that is that blindly sharing memory can be dangerous. So let's say, for example, you have three threads. Um, let's say I have an application where I want to correlate the number of curse words on a website with like hate mail that the website gets or something. I don't know. So then I would say, okay, thread one, I want you to go count curse words at this website, and thread two, go count curse words over here, and thread three, go over there. And then they would basically grab A, count curse words, increment A, and then overwrite, right? So there's some A equals plus equals kind of thing. Well, the problem would be is let's say thread one and thread two grab the value of A at the same time and then run off and do their counting of curse words. And then they increment A and then they come back and let's say thread one beats thread two barely. So then they say, okay, A was four, I counted 20 curse words, A is now 24. But then thread two is already like, A was four, I counted 30 curse words, A is now 34. So you see we actually have this issue with data corruption. Um, it's also known, an issue with that also is race conditions. And in particular with Python, this can be very, very troublesome because the way Python will actually release memory of variables, like when it says, okay, this, this variable is done being used, I'm gonna delete it from memory, is it has something called a reference count. Is basically, it just counts how many times that variable has been referenced. And when it reaches a certain number, let's say for a certain script, it knows that an array needs to be referenced 10 times. And when that array has been referenced 10 times, it's done. We can delete it from memory. But the problem is that if that reference count gets corrupted, let's say that it becomes 10 and it's only halfway through the script, Python will delete that array, but then it actually is referenced later in the script and it'll, you'll have really weird bugs that come up because you've either deleted memory too early or you actually haven't deleted memory at all. So then you have what's called memory leakage. So this is a very common problem that's known in multi-threaded uh, multi situations. There's a lot of different ways that you could actually um, handle this issue. And uh, CPython has done something called dun dun dun, the gill, which this looks a lot better on my computer because I have like bright, bright red paint here that says like CPython and then like 23 years of the gill, but you can't see red, so well, just know that I put a lot of effort in MS Paint into this. Um, so what is the global interpreter lock, the GIL? Um, the way that I like to think about it is, I don't know if this is maybe just a thing in the US, but sometimes if you have a, very, a group of very noisy people who continuously talk over one another and no one is listening, the moderator can come in and say, okay, you know what? Here is the speaking stone. Only the person holding the stone is allowed to speak and no one else can speak unless you have the stone. So then someone says, okay, yes, I take the stone, I will say my piece, and then when I'm done, I say, okay, I'm done, I release the stone, then everyone else fights, and then they try to get the stone, and then whoever grabs it next is like, haha, now it's my turn, I get to speak. So then they have the stone. And this is kind of how the gill works. Basically, all of the threads within a single Python process, you can't execute unless you have, you have acquired this lock so the gill, the lock is there, and then a thread will come in and be like, boom, I have the lock. Now I'm allowed to do computations and allowed to update the values of variables in Python in this instance. And then when it's done, it's like, okay, I'm done with my computations, I release the gill, and then another thread can come in and grab that lock, and then that thread can ex execute. Um, yeah, this is implemented, I think, in CPython and PyPy, not necessarily other types of Python. But again, you really don't really need to worry about this. You're almost 99% sure using CPython. So what does this mean for multi-threading? If you have pure Python code, and then you try to launch it with multiple threads, the gil will basically force it to run sequentially, because only one thread can execute 
Python code at a time. So just blindly throwing multi-threading at your problem might not actually do anything in terms of parallelization. There are exceptions. If you have a code or you're using a software package that has non-pure Python like under the hood, for example, NumPy uses some multi-threaded libraries under the hood, you can get around this. So using more threads will actually speed up your code because the guild doesn't actually know what's going on, so it can't lock things because these libraries are like kind of somewhere else to the side. Another uh, kit situation where uh, multi-threading works really well is if you have something called a network-bound problem. So this might be something where, like let's say you launch a query to an SQL database and then it takes like 30 seconds to come back. This is something where you can launch like eight of those and then they'll go, go off and run because it's not computing anything so it won't actually hold the guilt. So network-bound problems are also a good, uh, a good case for multi-threading. So that was option one, which is multi-threading. Option two is multi-processing, which I'm pretty sure you can guess what that's going to look like. Now we have multiple processes, and they live, perhaps one is on this LCPU, or it could also be over there. doesn't really matter. I just drew it this way. And then in this case, we'll just say that each process has one thread, and then each process has its own memory. So now we don't have that issue where multiple threads right, are trying to access the same memory. And what's cool about it is like each of these has its own gil, right? Because a process is an instance of the Python interpreter. So there's an instance of a gil here, an instance of a gil here, and so you don't really have them talking to each other in the same way. So you can get around this issue of threads and execution. But the downside is that they no longer share memory, right? So what this means is that we can have overhead, not only due to the creation of these processes, which takes a little bit longer, but it also means that in total we're taking up more memory because let's say I'm trying to do operations on a really big array. Now I need two separate copies of that array held in memory. So you can see we can get really bloated if you just throw multiprocessing at your problem. So when do we use multithreading and when do we use multiprocessing? So as a review for multiple threads, the nice thing is that they share memory. The downside is that they are limited by the gil. So maybe they don't run as fast as you think they would. Uh, multiple processes, there's overhead because they don't share memory, but they get around the gil. So that's nice. So in this case, for multiple threads, you want to use this with Python code that's not pure Python. So for example, NumPy, uh, and so that releases the gil. Alternatively, network-bound problems, right? Because you're not doing computations, you're sitting and waiting. All and then for multiple processes, you would use this with pure Python code that is hindered by the gil, or with problems that are CPU bound. So meaning that you just need to do a lot of computations and yeah. Okay. Or problems that don't use the same memory as the other problems. Yes. Yeah, though it's not necessarily, I mean, memory is, memory is a problem because of data corruption, but I mean, you'll still be, you'll still be limited by, by the gil, right? It doesn't really matter if they're touching the same variable, the gil will lock it all down. Right, that's what I mean. Yeah. So you can use multiple processes in that, and then you don't actually have the overhead of it not sharing memory, so that's no use. Ah, yes, either. right, so you don't have two re redundant copies of the same array, you'll have like array one and array two. Exactly. Yes, exactly, good point. So, so sometimes it's just easier to say, oh, I'm gonna use multiple processes and not think about it in that case because then you don't have to worry, like, oh, do I, might I be limited by the gil or not? Yes, okay, so that's actually a good segue into this next exercise, because this is kind of related to that, right? So um, Neil was saying that you can, in this case, you're not actually sharing memory because there, there are four different things. So this is what's called an embarrassingly parallel problem, because it's, it's very easy to parallelize. So apparently someone came up with the idea of it being embarrassing. Um, so, we basically have four integers. I think this should actually be zero through three, now that I think about it. I don't remember. Anyway, we have four instances, right? Where you have an input that goes into a function and then some output, which, yeah. Um, so, in this Python notebook, a Jupyter notebook that I'm gonna have you open up in a minute, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is look at the func option here. There's actually two of them. There's func one and func two. So understand what's going on. They're very simple functions, but just make sure you know what's going on. Um, 
And then you're going to evaluate this workflow, so four instances of this, uh, using a single thread, multiple threads, and multiple processes. How you change those paradigm, that's in the notebook. So you don't have to come up with that. That's just a plug and play kind of thing. Um, you should also, before you actually evaluate the workflow, make predictions on how long you think it will take. So time one instance of func1 and func2, and then say, OK, with single thread, I expect four of these to take blah seconds. Right? Make predictions. We're scientists. And then once you've done this evaluation, what do you observe? And then document your results. So make a little note uh, book, uh, notepad or something, so that we can come together and talk about it. And I should note that uh, in this demo, there will be functions from this package called Dask that I have not explained to you at all, uh, but I will later. So just don't worry about what's actually going on. Just do the predictions and yeah. So that's the name of the notebook. And uh, yeah, we'll spend some time on that and then we'll come back together and talk about it. So just to kind of summarize what you guys were kind of observing, um, there is overhead when you're spawning multiple threads and multiple processes, um, just because you have to kind of handle more things. Um, and this, the penalty, this overhead, will, will depend on your architecture. So it'll depend on literally what processors you have. It'll depend on if you're running Linux, on Windows. There's, I haven't really, I don't know of a rule of thumb that you could say it's always this or it's always that. It differs. And then, uh, yeah, time.sleep doesn't hold the gill. So it's kind of, it's a mimic of a network bound problem, right? You can launch them all, and then as soon as that time.sleep happens, it releases the gill, and someone else can come in and do some computation. So again, you need to pay attention to your code. You need to pay attention to, are you doing mostly pure Python? Are you doing uh, something that releases the gill? All sorts of stuff. Do you have a blend? Um, this is kind of where the art form of parallelization comes in, right? There's no fixed answer. All right, so that was part one. Now we're going to move into part two, which is task graphs and not so embarrassing problems. So we had this example, which is embarrassingly parallel, right? Because it's very easy to parallelize. And it's pretty clear how we could use multi threading or multi processing for this, right? Because you just launch a different one in a different thread or in a different process, right? That's pretty straightforward. But what about if you want to do something that's more complicated? So this, for example, is a diagram for a singular value decomposition of a very large matrix. It's not quite as clear if you need to do a computation like this how you could go and have multiple, multiple threads or multiple processes do that. So this is where we're going to talk about some uh, different parallelizing methodologies that exist. And I should note that this is shamelessly copied from uh, Matt Rockland's lecture in 2017, PyCon DE. Um, Matt Rockland, he is a developer for Dask, which is the package that we'll explain in a little later. So if you want to see an interesting lecture about parallelizing methodologies and other things, you should watch that. The link is in the slides. So the first group of problems they are embarrassingly parallel. That's what we just saw, right? Um, you can solve that using multiprocessing or joblib. Those are both uh, Python packages. Um, it's pretty easy. You just map a function onto a list of data, right? You say, I have 10,000 input files, and I want to do the same thing to all of my input files. Go forth, right? 90% of the problems that we work with, roughly, are this. The pros of these sorts of things is they're easy to install, they're lightweight, they're very familiar, we know how to do them, we can understand them. The cons of this is it doesn't really scale. Scale in the sense that like, I can't really run the exact same code on my computer and a local cluster and like an HPC cluster. I have to change things, I have to modify stuff. Um, and also, it can't handle complex algorithms. So like we just saw with that SVD, right? You can't really do that with Multiprocessing. I mean, you can, but you have to you have to do a lot of stuff of other stuff. The second category would be things that are related to big data collections, so like MapReduce, Flint, Spark, or SQL. So uh, these functions were are very nice. Um, they're scalable because they're meant to be deployed equally well on a cluster or your computer. 
and they have a lot of functions that are useful for big data applications. So the pros of this is there's a lot of new operations that exist in those. Um, and they're, they scale nicely, they're mature, so we believe in them, that's lovely. Uh, the cons is that they're heavyweight, so they often rely on things outside of Python. Uh, and they can't handle a computation that, like, for example, if you want to do something that doesn't exist in that library, you're kind of out of luck. Like, it is what it is, and if you want to do something else, well, good luck, I guess. So then the third category are what are called task schedulers. So you have things like Airflow, Luigi, Celery, Make. Um, I think Snake Make might fall into this, but I'm not sure. Um, and the way task schedulers work is that you actually define a graph of all of the functions that need to be done kind of within your calculation. And then the, d the data dependencies. So like, OK, I've done this, and then this portion needs to go over here, and then this portion needs to go over there. So just like we saw with that diagram a slide or two ago, that's a task graph. And then once you have the task graph, then you have what's called a scheduler that actually handles the parallelization. So that scheduler figures out which computations need to be done when in order to kind of make the whole thing go. The pros of these is that you have arbitrarily complex problems. You can have something embarrassingly parallel, or you can have that SVD matrix decomposition or something else, right? Other cool thing is that it's Python native, so we no longer have to worry about things outside of Python. It's just, let's work with what we know makes it familiar, that's nice. The cons, at least of these task schedulers, as, again, listed in this presentation, right? Um, they don't have what's called inter-worker storage. So you can think of like workers as the processes that do a lot of computations. So they don't necessarily talk nicely to each other in terms of data transfer, which means you can get long latencies and overhead. And the other thing that um, Rockland noted in this presentation is that these, these ones are not designed for user interaction. So what I mean with that is like once you launch a task graph and like have a scheduler go, you're kind of just like cross yourself and pray, like go get a coffee, and then when you come back, you just like hope that nothing has died and all of the results come back and make sense. There's no way for you to monitor stuff in real time. So yes, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Dask at all, you're like, what is this? What is this word you're saying? Um, so it's a Python package, shock, right? Um, and I took this quote off of the website because I just think it's so wonderfully propaganda-y, but it's just, ah. It's a Python package that provides advanced parallelism for analytics, enabling performance at scale for the tools you love. Which I just think is very, just, it's great. But practically, um, so this is a package that's actually developed by Continuum Analytics. So they're the people who develop Anaconda, who develop Spider, like all of these packages. It's them. Um, and uh, it, it it's can be used for easy parallelization of stuff, I would say. And there's a lot of really cool features, I think, about this package that we're going to learn about. Um, so from that parallelization methodology lecture that I just gave, um, what Rockland's goal was, and he's one of the main developers of Dask, so that's why I've been quoting him this whole time, uh, they want, we want, the scalability of Spark Flink databases. So we want something that runs equally well on my computer or a local cluster or my HPC cluster. I want the flexibility of Airflow and Celery for complex dependencies so you can handle really complex task graphs without having to do too much magic. And then also the familiarity and lightweight nature of m multiprocessing. So this is something that like you shouldn't be scared when you look at Dask code, right? You should be like, oh, I see what's going on. This makes sense. So that's the kind of a little bit of background into the Dask package itself. So Dask falls into the task scheduler realm, which means that there's two main steps and that it, it will do this for you, which I think is so nice. First off, creation of a task graph. It will do this for you. You write pure Python code. Well, not pure Python code. You write Python code with some Dask things. And then it will figure out all of the data dependencies, all of the subfunctions, all of this stuff. And then Dask also comes with what are called schedulers, which then figure out how to do these computations and in which order to work your way all the way up through the computation. So that's the two main steps. So for a task graph, Let's say that you have some sort of workflow that looks like this on the left, right? You have two data sets that you want to process, so you get outputs from data set one and data set two. And you have some custom function to compare those outputs. Maybe there's certain heuristics you want to look at. 
So then you have the diff that is the result of that function. And then maybe you save output one, and then you want to save the diff as well. This is then what the task graph at Dask would make for you. This is bright red on my screen, and maybe your screen as well, but oh well. So you have data sets one and two, go through the function, out one, out two, and then maybe you save some options there. So in short, a task graph is just a visual representation of the functions and the data dependencies, which is nice. It's nice to be able to look at something and be like, oh, I see how everything goes. I'm a very visual person, so this makes sense to me. OK, so what we're going to be doing now is going through this demo of Dask delayed, because you'll need to use this delayed function for the exercise that's right after. Um, so first, I will open Jupyter Notebook in my Conda environment. And the one that I'm running this time is demo desk delayed. Uh, for you guys, after this example is over, um, you'll also have the filled option, which has all the text that I'm about to type. So you can look at that when this is over. OK. Yes. So. Um, something that I should also note, I was really hoping um, Dask had claimed that the installation of GraphViz, we'll talk about that later. Um, there's some things in here that you unfortunately cannot do without, having, without setting things up more particularly on Windows. So I am sorry about that. Um, nope. There we go. Okay. So first off, the function that I'm using in this demo is called map. And uh, it's a function that's built into Python. And the idea with map is that it takes two arguments. It takes a function handle, and then it takes a list of inputs. So what map does is it maps that function to all of the inputs. So in this case, we're just going to have a very easy function called inc, which just takes in a single input, an integer or a number, whatever, and then it just returns 1 plus that number. And then the inputs, let's just say it's going to be integers from 0 to 3, right? So this is just an example. So the way map would work, if I was to map ink onto my inputs, well, first off, if I just do that, it'll produce a map object, which is a little bit less useful. So let's actually just convert it to a list. There we go. So we can see that my inputs, again, 0, 1, 2, 3. Ink has been applied to all of them, so I get one, two, three, four out of it. So this is just like that embarrassingly parallel workflow that we saw before, right? We're just applying the same function to all list of inputs. Now, let's talk about delayed. So from Dask import delayed. So a delayed object is basically, it's kind of like a placeholder for a function. So you're kind of saying, hey, this is a function, and you have a handle to it, but you don't actually want that function to evaluate. So the way you would create that is like this. So from Dask, I've imported delayed, which is a function uh, that Dask has defined. And then I've called delayed on my function inc to get this new thing. And this new thing is actually a delayed object object in Dask. And you can see that it has the name, the function name itself, and then also has a unique hash key. And the reason for this is that if you have a very complex task graph with a lot of different instances of the same function, Dask needs to be able to know which function corresponds to which part of the task graph. So every time you create a delayed object, you get a new hash key. So this is just a way of Dask for keeping it um, bookkeeping, I guess. So now that we have our delayed function, so again, and it's not actually doing anything, right? So I've created ink, but well, it's, it doesn't actually do any calculations. So we can use map in, exact the same, in exactly the same way. Actually, let's say z is list map. So before we had ink here, right, instead of our delayed increment function. 
And then the output before was actually the, the return of the ink. It actually went through, it took ink, and it applied it to all of them. Now what we've actually done is we've created delayed instances of all these functions. And they're called lazy because they actually don't compute anything, right? So it's kind of like we've set this up, but we haven't actually done any calculations. So one of the cool things about Dask, and this is the part that unfortunately I don't think you guys can do on your computers without actually setting things up a little further, is you can visualize things. You can visualize the task graphs that Dask, oop, but first you need to import Dask. Very important. There we go. So when you have a collection of Dask objects, then you can always call Dask.Visualize and it'll, it'll draw the task graph for you. So you can see exactly what this computation is going to look like. And it hasn't computed anything. We haven't run ink, right? It's just set up the dependencies. So it's nice because you can set everything up and you can look at the task graph and make sure, does that look like what you think it should look like? Maybe you can change the logic to make it look better. And then when you actually think everything looks good, you run the computation and get your output. Yeah. Yeah, so what it's actually mapping is like the data dependencies. So in general, actually, and we'll get into this in a little bit, you guys probably won't actually use Dask delayed in a lot of your calculations because Dask has what are called higher level objects. So you actually don't need to mess with it on this level. But it, I think it's a really nice way to kind of mess around with how it works um, and see, see what's going on. So um, yeah, so calling a delayed object is just building that data dependency graph and all the functions. Yep. So you can look at it and then you can compute everything. OK. So. That was the introduction to Dask Delayed. What you guys are going to do next, uh, I have a few notes and then we'll, then we'll move on. So Delayed, again, it's a lazy version of a function, right? It doesn't actually do any computations. You're just saying, hey, I'm a thing. Give it a hash key. Do all that good stuff. Um, if your computer is configured correctly, which I don't think yours are, you can visualize using Dask.Visualize. Or if Z is a Dask object, so it could be a delayed object, it could be some other things that are defined in Dask, you can also directly call visualize. And same thing with compute. Once you look at your uh, Dask graph and you think it looks good, you can compute using um, Dask.ComputeZ or, again, Z.Compute, just like the visualize. Um, so normally, I would have you guys do this exercise here, build a better reduce. But since you guys probably cannot visualize, I think OK, so as I kind of mentioned in passing, you know, we don't really we probably won't really use delayed for most of our stuff. We'll actually use some of Dask's other objects. Um, in particular, Dask, I just think this is so cool. Dask has an array that they've actually, they've worked with NumPy developers, and it's a parallelizable NumPy array. So it's basically a NumPy array, but you can deploy it on a cluster or something. Um, and the idea is that you actually, when you define your array, you separate it into chunks. So you say like how big each chunk is of your array. And then when you call these kind of algorithms, for example, like SVD decomposition, then Dask knows which chunks need to go where. As an example, here's four lines of code. So from Dask, import array as DA for Dask array, right? Then we're just creating a random array. Well, it's sort of uh, 200,000 by 100. And each chunk is 10,000 elements long by 100. So you can see this total array will have 200 chunks. And then we're calling uh, SVD. And then we visualize. One thing I should note is that this is actually, if you were to run this in Dask, you could do this on your computer, and it would run instantaneously because you're not actually doing any calculations here yet, right? Everything is basically delayed. All you're doing is setting up this task graph. 
So that's actually what's going on in these first four lines, is you're just saying, OK, Dask, eventually when I call compute, I want you to create a random array that's 200,000 by 100, and then calculate the SVD of that. So then down here, you would have to have dask.compute, right? But this will run instantly, more or less. So it's so cool because now you don't really have to mess with all that stuff under the hood. Anywhere you have an NumPy array, you're just like, let's just throw a Dask array instead. It's not exactly that easy, but we can pretend. So you've been thinking, ah, oh, maybe I'm still not quite convinced. In addition to an array, they also have a data frame. So if you want to have, for example, big data applications where you have massive amounts of data that can't be loaded into memory, but you need to do um, for example, some power statistics or something. Um, a DAS data frame, it's basically the same as a pandas data frame, but it's kind of, again, been kind of chunked up. It's a collection of a bunch of different data frames. Um, so again, three lines of code. We're just using a built-in data set with Dask, and we're just doing a simple filter. We're saying, hey, give me the elements of this data frame where y is greater than zero, and then visualize, and you get this task graph down here. So in this case, it's actually embarrassingly parallel because you're basically just sub-chunking your pandas data frame and then doing the filter on each of those. So this one's a little bit easier logically, but still, like you wouldn't want to code that manually. So it's nice that it can do this for you. And then you can launch this on whatever scheduler, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we will soon. So what this means for you is that you have, potentially, you can parallelize your code today by just replacing your NumPy arrays with Dask arrays and Pandas data frames with Dask data frames. Is it actually that easy? Probably not, but it could be. Depends on what you're trying to do. Setting up task graphs is super easy because it does it for you. Um, you can either do like a low-level task graph by, uh, using delayed. So again, with that example with the reduce is you were actually you would be able to look at the logic and say, ah, oh, well, if I switch this order and that order, I can actually make this much more parallelizable. Or you can do something that's high level. So you just throw Dask arrays and Dask data frames into the problem. The tricky part is launching the computations efficiently, and whether this means on your computer, on a cluster, or wherever. And this is where the scheduler part comes in. So now we're going to talk about schedulers. So part three, schedulers and running computations. So there are two main schedulers that come with Dask. The first off is what's called a single machine scheduler. This is one of their oldest schedulers. Um, it's quite robust. Um, it's the default. And it's also the way they have designed the logic so that it's kind of optimal for larger than memory problems. So what this means is they try to delete intermediate variables as soon as they're not needed. Dask goes through and it tracks. OK, this variable is done being calculated. Boom, I'm going to delete it. There are some cases where, as Neil was pointing out, that might not be ideal. Um, there are three main options in the scheduler, and these should look very familiar, because these are what you just did in that first exercise. You can choose to be single-threaded, in which case Dask will execute everything within a for loop. Um, this is really only useful for debugging. Like That's a nice baseline. You don't really want to actually run calculations with a single threaded option. If you call threads, what it's actually doing under the hood is it's calling a multiprocessing.pool.threadpool. So if you're familiar with the multiprocessing, that's actually all Dask is calling, is just the thread pool option. Um, if you were to call a like, dot compute, and then the object upon which you're calling it is like a Dask array, or a Dask data frame, or a Dask delayed object, this is the default, this is the default scheduler. Um, because those things are calling pandas or numpy, and so they're getting around the gill, so they'll use multi-threading by default. If you call processes, then you're doing multiprocessing.pool to span multiple processes. Um, and this is the default for an option called dask bag, which we haven't talked about, but it's like a list or a dictionary. Um, and sometimes, depending on what you're trying to do with data frames, it will be useful for data frames. Um, but that's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then they note that if you're using the processes option in uh, the single machine scheduler, you really shouldn't be using the single machine scheduler, probably. You should be using the distributed scheduler, which we will get to next. Um, 
Yeah, just some last things about the scheduler. There's um, different ways you can change the options. First off, you can do it directly when calling compute. Pass it in as a keyword argument. Um, you can do it with what's called a context manager. So when you have that, 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 the with blah statement, that means that all of the indented code is just temporarily given that setting, more or less. It's more complicated than that, but we'll pretend. You can also do it globally, like at the top of a script. So you could say, for all of my task functions after this, I want you to use this scheduler option. I would not recommend doing this, um, but you can. OK, so let's get into the really cool scheduler, which is the distributed scheduler. Um, it's really cool because even though it's called distributed, it doesn't actually mean that you have to be doing distributed computing. I mean, it just, like, it just means that it's using more than one CPU, right? Um, so it works just as well on your laptop with its four logical CPUs, in my case. Or it can also work on a cluster if you have like, you know, a local cluster set up. Um, it has access to the asynchronous API, which you have. If you don't know what that means, that's fine. You don't need to worry about that. But if you do know what it means and you want that, use this. Um, it's a little bit better at handling data locality or kind of which workers take which jobs. So that's why it's a little bit more efficient when you have the multiprocessing option. Um, and the super cool thing about this, I mean, I just think it's really, really neat, <laughs> is it, has, it comes with a really cool dashboard, which I'm going to show off to you guys in a bit. Yeah, for more info on this scheduler, uh, there's a 2016 lecture by Rockland at SciPy. Uh, the link is in the references at the end of the slides, so you can go watch it. I just watched a bunch of YouTube videos to teach myself this stuff. So now I'm just giving you all the YouTube videos. It is a little bit more complicated than the single machine scheduler, so we need to define a few things before we can run it. So uh, this was, again, modified from that SciPy lecture. But the way, the, the parts of this distributed scheduler, well, first off, you have the scheduler itself. So this is responsible for kind of throwing things places, as we'll see. And then the scheduler works with workers. And this should look kind of familiar back to the beginning of the slides, because a worker is actually a process. And then each worker process has a number of threads. And you specify how many workers, and you specify how many threads each worker gets. And then the scheduler, well, we'll get there. The combination of the scheduler and workers, that's what Dask calls a cluster. So if you create a cluster in Dask, you're creating a scheduler and a series of workers. That's kind of their terminology. In addition to that, we have something called a client, who is us, right? We're the ones who specify what the code does, like what our task graph looks like. So that's our job. We create the task graph. And then when we're ready with that and we call compute, then that task graph is given to the scheduler. And then the scheduler looks at the task graph and it figures out, OK, I'm going to walk through this task graph. And I'm going to say, OK, you, computation, you're going to go to that worker. And you, computation, you're going to this worker. And then it figures out where to distribute stuff. And there's a bunch of heuristics on how this works that we're not going to go into. But that's the overall way or kind of diagram of how this works. So you can see now that there can be a lot of overhead when running Dask, right? Because no longer you're just kind of doing multi-threading directly. Now you've got to create a scheduler process, and you've got to create this like connection, and then all of these are processes. And then there's a process in here that I totally didn't even draw that's called a nanny, and she does stuff. And like, yeah. So in certain applications, it might not make sense to use Dask. But in certain applications, this overhead that's created is vastly outweighed by the benefit of parallelization. So it's a really case-by-case -case basis. So, and as I mentioned, we're the ones who have to determine the number of workers and the number of threads, which is also a bit of an art form. Uh, in general, a rough rule of thumb that is pres prescribed is that the number of cores, so logical CPUs on wherever you're running, that should be equal to the total number of threads that you have. So the number of workers times the number of threads per worker. Um, the idea with this is this is like kind of roughly optimal because theoretically, all of these threads could then execute perfectly in parallel. It will never, it probably won't ever actually do that. There's a bunch of other switching and stuff. But rough rule of thumb. And then we have kind of similar rules as before when we were discussing like when to use multi-threading and when to use multi-processing. If you have code that releases the gil, 
So if you're running like NumPy or Dask arrays or stuff like that, in general, you want to have fewer processes but more threads in each process because that's not limited by the gil, right? Or if you have code that's more tends to be pure Python something, then you would want to have more processes and fewer threads, especially if they don't share memory, right? Beyond that, unfortunately, it's really hand wavy. Okay, literally, I'm quoting a Stack Overflow comment from Mac Rocklin at this point. Um, but what he recommended is that if you're using mostly NumPy or Pandas style data, um, you want at least eight threads in a process. Um, otherwise, maybe only two threads in a process. So unfortunately, this is the kind of thing where you have to just run the same workflow a couple times and be like, what about four? And then you go get a coffee. And then you're like, what about six? <laughs> and then you go get a coffee, right? Like there's no, this is again, art form, not hard rules of thumb. On, on yes, I mean, it also makes a big difference on the amount of IO that you have to do. Um, yes. Because there we're extremely IO bound given the issues that we have with the Lustre file system and things like that. So yeah, and file transfer and stuff. You, you'll often find that, yeah, playing around with this, you, you're often playing games with how can I reduce my IO wait time as opposed to how can I increase my CPU. Yeah. Yeah, that's also a really good point. It's like for our cluster, it takes forever to do like data writing or kind of transfer stuff. So yeah, it's again, sadly, not, not the most uh, easy thing to pick up. Um, but rough rules of thumb. Yes. OK, so let's first, I'm going to show you guys a demo of the distributed scheduler because it's just so cool. You guys need to see it. To mention the interface between Dask and the cluster schedulers. Um, you mean the Tor uh, Dask job queue? Like the PBS cluster or like Swarm? That's Dask job queue uh, briefly on the last slide. Okay. Yeah. We'll get there. Yep. Um, yeah, distributed scheduler. OK. So. We start by importing some objects from Dask that we need. So the first thing we need to do is we need to actually create the cluster. So if you remember, the cluster has is associated with a scheduler plus workers. So for this example that I have here, I'm creating what's called a local cluster. That means I'm running on my computer here. Um, I'm specifying four workers, which if you remember, that means four processes. And I'm saying that each worker gets one thread. So I should have four threads in total which works on this computer because I have four logical CPUs, right? Um, that takes a little bit of a moment to set up. And then if I print, what you'll see is that I get an address. Uh, they list the number of workers that I have. And they also list the, no the total number of threads that I have prescribed, which in this case, I've prescribed four threads in total, right? One for each worker. Uh, the first address, um, that's actually the address to the scheduler, uh, which most of the time you guys won't really need to use. But what's nice about that is if you want to like add more workers, like if you want to scale up or scale down your workflow, you can do that via this address. So you can say, like, connect to the scheduler that lives at this address, give them three more workers or something. For most of us, I don't really, like for, for our applications, I don't really think we'll have to do that. But it's nice. Um, so within the cluster object, you can look at the scheduler. So again, there's that address we had. It tells you, and now this is one thing I don't love. Then they changed the, the naming convention. It used to be called workers, and now they call it processes. I've actually submitted a, an issue to see if we can make this match, but I don't think it's gone anywhere yet. Um, but anyway, four processes, four, and they call it cores, but it's actually the total number of threads. So that's not really quite quite accurate. Um, and you can also list the workers. So you see we have workers 0, 1, 2, 3. Each worker has a nanny process, as I mentioned, um, who uh, basically, yeah, so she spawns, monitors, and then kills the workers when they're done. So she's pretty fierce. I like it. Um, and then, yeah, you can see the number of threads within each worker.
So this is the cool thing. So this is called the dashboard. Um, and you can see there are different tabs up there, so you can look at different things. So what is really neat about this is once I call compute, and I'm not going to do it for a sec because I want to explain some things first, is it will show you how many tasks each worker is working on in real time. It'll show you uh, how much memory each worker has. So you can see if one worker has a lot more memory than the other workers, there's something that's kind of uneven. Uh, the scheduler is not working like it should. And you can actually see it'll show you which functions it's working on. So let's, uh, well, first we have to create a client. So let's do that. All right. So create a task graph. This is just that my reduced task graph that I showed you earlier. There we go. So this is the task graph I want to run. Um, I'm calling my reduce on 12 numbers, 0 to 11. So this is the task graph. So if I go to graph here, this is, we can probably only do this once. If I run compute now, it shows it. And it, you can see processing, things that are held in memory because they need to be used, and then done, released, cleared. And so you can see Dask working. Oh, and then it finishes too quickly. Ah, oh, um, I'll launch it again. Hopefully, it'll still work. Yes, OK. Quick, back. So it, you can see it working its way through. And it, oh, I, should have, you know, I probably shouldn't have had four, because I'm working on four at the same time. If I do one at a time, it, it goes much slower. I have more time to speak. But yeah, I won't do that. I'll just keep coming over here and entering it. So this is super nice, right? Because this means that you're, you actually have real-time updates of how you're moving through your task graph, whether things are being held, um, how it's processing, um, all of that good stuff. You can kind of, it helps with debugging to figure out why is this not working, why is it taking longer, um, and figuring out release in memory. So uh, now, yeah, wait, let's run it one last time. So each worker in this time gets one task per worker because I only have one thread, right? So they're limited by the guild. Memory stored in each worker, and then you can see that it's red here. I can actually mouse over it. Not red. That's uh, blue. That's what color that is. So if you actually have multiple functions in a very complicated task graph, it'll actually color code these according to the function. So you can see which functions were being executed. This is time. And then this is worker, worker 0, 1, 2, 3. So you can look at which workers are being doing what. Um, it's very useful. And then there's a small bit of red. You can't really see this, but that's actually communication. So that's where Dask needed to wait to communicate something from to another. And then white here indicates that the scheduler wasn't actually able to do anything. So it actually, there was a worker that was idle. So we're not going to go too much into this. There's actually an entire talk about it on YouTube. Shock, right? I think the 2016 lecture that I uh, had mentioned already. Um, so there, it will. Uh, you can go into that a little bit. And then, uh, if you're done working with stuff, then you should close everything out. So here's the. You can close it, and then I've actually found it sometimes doesn't close things very nicely. So I've also started deleting the objects, and it still doesn't really close nicely. So I've kind of just given up on Dask closing things nicely. There's, there's several um, issues yeah. kind of it not closing. Yep. Um, a lot of it's related to this weird tornado thing yeah. that's used for async in Python. Um, and it seems like every time the tornado changes something, it breaks any of the fixes that they put in Dask. Um, so hopefully now with 3.7 putting async in Python itself yeah. properly, um, we can start seeing projects move away from tornado. Using tornado? OK. it'll start working. OK, so that's, that's the demo of the cluster. So now you guys actually get to mess, mess around with it. Um, so go ahead and try the following variations. I mean, just mess around with different variables. Look at the task graphs. How does it work? How fast does it move? How many workers do you have? Um, you can change the number of workers. So I had four. What happens if you try two, if you try one, if you try six? It'll also depend on your architecture, how many logical CPUs you have. If you have more than I do, you can run more than I can. Uh, changing number of threads per worker. Um, another option that you can do is if you set processes to false, what this actually do is it turns each worker into a thread um, instead of a process. And then 
yeah, there are some other tweaks as well. Yes, and as we were just noting, it doesn't always shut down the dashboard cleanly. So if you change, like your, if even if you've like closed the client, deleted the client, and then you try to like go back to the task graph and it's no longer running if you hit compute, you might just need to restart the kernel completely if you want your task graph to work again. But um, that's just a side note. So yeah, go ahead and uh, take, uh, take some time and explore these options and mess around with that dashboard. Put the dashboard to the side so you're dual screening like I had earlier. Cool. Well, did you guys at least, did everyone get it running so like you could see, you could see the schedule or you could see it working? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Good. Um, this was another exercise. If you had time or were bored, you could also mess with some examples for Dask arrays um, or data frames or machine learning. Uh, yes. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Final notes and best practices. Um, the most important thing, try to avoid Dask. Sounds counterintuitive, I know. We just spent an entire, what, two hours and a half talking about Dask. Um, this is actually directly from the web page. I'm not just now completely countering everything. The reason for this is Dask comes with overhead. It comes with a new level of complexity. Things, you try to parallelize them and they may not make sense. Um, so it's very possible that if you just use a better algorithm or perhaps like sparse matrices, if you compile your code and do some proper profiling, you might get away from using Dask. It might not be the right tool for what you need to do. When, if you do decide that Dask is the tool for you and you're using it, um, it's actually really useful to use that dashboard to, to check your jobs and track them. So dual screening like that so you can main, can kind of uh, keep an eye on what's going on. It's very, very nice. Um, parallelism can be counterintuitive. So you think something will run faster and then it doesn't. So then you have to figure out why. Um, in general, if you're ever doing anything where you're like creating a client uh, option, due to how that script is then called, always protect your code in like an if name equals main block. So we didn't really, we didn't have to here because we were in Jupyter. But in general, you should always have that if name equals main for .py files. The syntax in Dask is redundant or flexible, if you want to think about it that way. So there are probably several other ways to do what we did. So for example, creating a cluster and creating a scheduler, we did it one way, but there's other syntax. So if you look in the docs and you see a slightly different way, that's just because there's different ways that you can create this cluster scheduler client thing. Uh, lastly, this is something that hopefully you won't run into this issue, but you might. So as we mentioned, NumPy uses this BLAS uh, linear algebra library that is actually multi-threaded and it's, it's meant to use all of the threads possible on your machine. So as number of logical CPUs as you have, BLAS will use. What this means is that it sometimes doesn't play nicely with Dask because on Dask you're also telling your computer to use all the threads available. So if you're doing Dask and then you're over-prescribing threads because it's also calling NumPy, which in like multiple instances, um, you might have trouble. So then there's this global variable thing that you have to mess with. But hopefully none of your code will come across this issue. But it is something that you need to be aware of. Things we didn't discuss. Uh, as I mentioned very briefly, there's also an, uh, an object in Dask called a bag, which is very similar to like a list or a dictionary kind of thing. Uh, this is really useful. Let's say if you have a bunch of JSON files and you needed to do processing across that, you would maybe want to do a Dask or a bag, uh, excuse me, a bag object, object. English. Um, there's a kind of Dask package that we didn't really discuss called Dask ML that is actually meant for parallelizable machine learning. So if any of you are into big data machine learning, there's an entire package just for that. Um, Neil mentioned this. Uh, briefly, so there's also a package called Dask Job Queue that lets you launch all of this stuff on the cluster. So in, on our HPC cluster, on Yes, for example, assuming that we get the configurations right, which we're still working on. Um, so I'm still working on this personally for the Python package that I'm developing. So hopefully we'll have some more Yes-specific instructions 
within the next couple months so that you guys can do it too. So if you have something that works here, theoretically, the only step you need to change, you don't change your code at all. It's just instead of saying uh, like a local cluster object, you just have a PBS cluster. And then Dask under the hood will actually write the PBS files and launch them on using the torque scheduler and then can do all of the communication so you don't have to worry about that. So um, Dask, they actually have a really cool blog for um, kind of what they're doing and what they're, because it's, it's very actively under development. They're also looking at GPU computation. So GPU is your graphical processor. You have a lot of them, but they only do very simple computations. But if you can parallelize with GPUs, um, I think, for example, they had one demo where they just did this random matrix kind of computation thing. Normally, it would take like three hours on CPUs, and on GPU, it was like a second or something. Like massive speed ups if you do it, if you do it properly. So read the blog. And honestly, there's a lot we didn't cover. Like there is a lot about parallelization and Dask and other things. Um, so hopefully this is a nice like overview and we'll kind of get you going, but be aware there's a lot under the hood. Um, so in summary, what have we learned? Uh, so at the very beginning, part one, right? We covered some basic CPU uh, computer architecture. So CPUs, hyperthreading, processes, threads, the gill, dun, dun, dun. Um, oh. Too early. The gill, dun dun dun. Multi-threading, um, and then also, of course, some packages that get around the gill. So, like NumPy, pandas. Uh, we discussed what are task graphs and how we can design functions that are more parallelizable. So this would have been that my reduce example, um, if you guys had done the example. Uh, the single machine scheduler and distributed scheduler in Dask. So again, single machine. That's the default one, but distributed scheduler is quite nice and flexible. And then we wrapped up with some best practices and then unmentionables, so things we didn't discuss here. So that's it. As you guys are aware, everything is available on GitLab. Um, you're welcome to come to me with feedback or suggestions for further topics if you think more stuff could be talked about. Other than that, um, thank you for your time and your patience. And yeah, I'll be here for questions, so feel free to come up and ask them. That's it. You're free. Yay.